Good morning. May I welcome you to this service of worship. Uh, if this is the first time that you're back since we have gathered together again, uh, can I give you a special warm welcome today. Um, it's great that we can come together and continue to worship and share in fellowship as brothers and sisters in Christ, taking one step at a time towards something more like what we have been so used to here uh, in Craiga. But just may I take this opportunity to uh, remind you of a few um, things regarding uh, the arrangements uh, at the service this morning. These three weeks, this being the third, have acted as an experiment to see how we may continue to move towards something uh, more akin to how we usually worship here in Craiga. We want to create an environment that is both welcoming and safe, and while I would encourage all our members to come back to worship, believing it's safe to do so with the measures we have taken, I also want to say that no one should come to services if they have symptoms or if they need to shield. While the NI executive have outlined one metre as a safe distance, the guidelines issued by PCI state that there are no restrictions on numbers as long as two metres social distance is maintained in order to be as safe as possible and to build confidence for the way ahead. The service itself will be shorter than normal and while the Chief Scientific Advisor to the NI Executive has stated that singing as part of a socially distanced service of worship is very low risk, it was felt that there ought not to be congregational singing for at least these three weeks, moving towards that sometime in the future. There will be no offering plates passed around at the service this morning, but there are three stations, one in the vestibule, one in the McIntyre suite, and one in the gallery that you can use to drop your offering into as you leave the building. Due to contact tracing, we have been instructed to keep a record of those attending services for the time being. Therefore, if you're here and have not registered, would you please let an usher know so your attendance can be noted. Uh, tomorrow morning, all procedures will be reviewed, following which a further update will be sent out to you uh, to tell you of any changes that we hope to make. So for the time being, may I ask you to register for next Sunday, the 2nd of August, in the same manner that you have registered thus far for these services. And should you not be able to attend after you have registered, if you would let Michael know so that you can be removed from the register for that Sunday so that it will be as accurate as possible. As we begin our service today, it is with sincere regret that I announce the death of Mrs. Ruth Carnew, formerly of Glendale Park. A service of thanksgiving for her life was held on Thursday afternoon. May I contend, commend her daughter Aris and the whole family circle to your prayers at this sad time, and we will remember her and the family circle later on in the service together. Today we continue to unpack the identity of Jesus. We have done the last two weeks uh, some exploring, if you like, about who Jesus is and why it is so important for us to understand his identity. Jesus is the giver of rest. He is the Lord. And today we look to him and see that he is the Messiah. Messiah is the English translation of a Hebrew word which means anointed one. And the Hebrew word for Messiah comes into Greek as Christos, hence the word Christ. When we speak of Jesus Christ, we are actually speaking of Jesus who is the anointed one, who is the Messiah, pointing to him who is our prophet, our priest, and our king. Jesus is the Christ the Messiah, the Anointed One, commissioned to rescue his people. So today we echo the desire of the Apostle Peter when he wrote to the Christians and said, Know the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Know him so that you would grow and that the glory would belong to him both now and forevermore. Let us pray together. God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, righteous and good Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, our wonderful Messiah, 
draw us closer to yourself on this your day. Deliver us from sin, from ignorance, from indifference, from coldness of heart, from wandering of mind. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of wisdom and truth. Enable us to worship you in spirit and in truth. May everything that we do, say and think about be pleasing to you. We ask today that you would build us up in most holy faith, fellowship and service. So as brothers and sisters, we would know the help and strength to be your people today and always. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sit together, uh, John is going to play two hymns, one now and one at the end of the service. As he plays, the words will appear on the screen. Use this time to read and follow along and reflect upon these words as we worship God quietly together. Our first item is, Come, O Long Expected Jesus. Let us now open the Word of God together. Our reading today comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 15 to 21, and the words will appear on the screen um, as I read them. Let us remember that this is the Word of God. Up until this point, uh, if you remember, Jesus has challenged the Pharisees about the nature of the Sabbath, and as a result of that challenge, they have sought and conspired to kill him. And we pick up the reading after that confrontation between Jesus and the Pharisees. Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. Many followed him, and he healed all their sick, warning them not to tell who he was. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant, whom I have chosen, the one I love, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel nor cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out, till he leads justice to victory. In his name, the nations will put their hope. Amen. And we thank God for his word. 
It's still sad that I can't invite uh, the boys and girls to the front, but I think we only have girls this morning, but there are boys and girls coming to the next service, and there'll also hopefully be boys and girls watching this service at home later on today. So to all of you, uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time chatting to you today. Now, we're going to see a couple of things up on the screen in a wee moment, um, and I want you to think about what you would expect to see, or what you would expect to do if you saw these signs. So, what's the first one? That's an easy one, isn't it? That's a stop sign. So if you're driving down the road and you see that sign, what do you do? You stop the car. If you see somebody in front of you and they just drove on past and they didn't stop, you would say, no, they didn't do what the sign said. The sign means stop. The sign means stop. That's a really easy one. But what about the next one? And what's that one mean? That's an exit sign. That's the way to go in an emergency. And you should see them about the building, actually. They show us the way to go. If there was an emergency and we had to leave the building, we would go that way. If there was an emergency and we're all trying to leave the building and you saw somebody going the other way, you would say, no, look at the sign. That's the way we have to go. That's the way we have to go. That's the way we can be safe. So what about the next one? Now, you know this one. That's McDonald's. Everybody knows that one. If you're driving down the road and you have a bit of a hungry belly and you see a big golden M and you pull in uh, to get a happy meal, you know that that's what you're going to get. If you pull in and somebody give you uh, uh, an Ulster fry or somebody give you uh, a baguette or somebody give you something like that, you would say, well, that's not what it means. When I go to McDonald's, I want the burger and the chips and the toy and all of that. We know what the sign means and we would know if we got the wrong thing when we went there. What's the next one then? Now what's this mean? Well, that's, that's the bathroom. If you're looking for a bathroom and you see that sign and you go in and there wasn't a bathroom there, you would be really disappointed um, because you would find not what you needed at that particular time. That sign tells us where we need to go when we need to use the bathroom. Now, I think there might be another one. Oh yes, there's a couple more. Now, what's this one? Well, this is a school or a playground, somewhere where children are. So if someone's driving down the road, they see this sign, they say, I need to be careful, I need to drive slowly because there might be children about. And you can imagine if this sign was there and there was no school, there's no playground, there was no neighborhood anywhere, if that sign was in the middle of an empty field, it would look silly because it wouldn't show us the truth of what was around. So that's another sign. And I think there's one more. Yes, it's really important that you know what this sign means. This is an irritant, and you should see that on the back of bleach and the back of bottles underneath the sink. And this means don't play with this. This means don't play with this stuff because this stuff could be dangerous. So it's a cross, it's an X to say, stay away from this stuff. And that's a really important one for us to remember. You wouldn't imagine seeing this sign on a bottle of orange juice or on a chocolate bar or something like that because it wouldn't point to the truth of what was going on. And that's why that's so important. So there are some signs. And signs are so important because what they do is they point to us to the truth of what is going on and how uh, we are to understand the things that are around us. I want you to think about Jesus and how Jesus did lots of signs when he came to earth. He taught, he performed miracles, and all of the things that he did were pointing towards him being the Messiah, the anointed one of God. All the miracles he performed, the sick and hurt people he made well, even some people he raised from the dead, Jesus clearly wanted us to see who he was and is. And Jesus fulfilled all these big promises of God so that we would know that he is the Messiah. And Jesus wrapped up all of these signs in two things. And this is one of the signs that he gave to us. And that is the cross. The cross is a very important sign because on the cross we can see that Jesus went to die for our sin uh, and loved us so much to do that and we can therefore confess our sin to him because he took it to the cross. But look at the cross and see that Jesus isn't on the cross anymore. The cross is empty. The sign that we see there is an empty cross because the greatest sign that Jesus gave to us was not dying on the cross but raising from the tomb and coming back to life. Because there we can see that not only did he die for our sins, but he defeated our sins 
and therefore we can trust in him because only he was able to do that. And that sign says to us that only Jesus could do such an amazing thing to die for our sins, to rise again to life so that we can share in the goodness of the life that he gives to us. So remember all the signs, but that's the most important sign. And remember it tells us two things, that Jesus died for us, that Jesus rose for us. And the third thing I suppose that it tells us is that only he could do such a thing. Will we pray? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord and Father, for Jesus. Help us to always remember who he is, the Messiah, the one who came to rescue us. Help us to follow him. We want to say sorry for all the times that we forget and make mistakes. So bless us today in Jesus' lovely name and remind us that he died for us, that he rose again for us, and only he could do such a thing. Amen. Amen. So now we're going to come to reflect again together. Uh, over the last couple of weeks we've had uh, some music and some time to, to reflect and to think about the music that is played. Uh, this time around we're going to do something a little bit different. I have a, a video to show you um, about a Jewish lady called Rose who is a concentration camp survivor and she talks about how she found Jesus the Messiah. So while this video was playing, um, the children can go out uh, to Kids Zone. Life in the camps, <laughs> how, how can you describe a hell? Well, we would work from dark to dark. We, we would get up, it was dark, we would go to be counted first. Um, we would have to line up five deep and as long as the, they are people. My mother and the rest of the family were murdered in Treblinka. I was in three camps in Poland and three camps in Germany. And the beatings were constantly. It's all Jesus' fault. Every time we were hit, the guard would tell us, Jesus told us to hit you. Jesus hates you. I was raised that God is everything. God in the morning, God at noon, and God at night. And one day I took a look around where I was in 1941 or 42, and I said, there is no God. My mother lied. Well, what it was like to get out of the camps. Of course, we didn't believe it. And then somebody came up with an idea of getting even. This person didn't have to repeat. I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to kill Jesus. So where does Jesus live? In the church. So what are you going to do with the church? You're going to burn it down. So if you burn down the church, Jesus cannot live there anymore. He's dead. We had so much hate. And when we came back to the group, we reunited. I took my sister's hand and I said, it's time to go home. And after a while, my sister had married and gone to Israel and I was gonna follow her. And then I wound up in America through circumstances. And uh, shortly after I came, I met my husband, we got married. We, I was blessed with children, and many things happen. And one day, my oldest daughter comes home and she says, Mommy, 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 I believe in Jesus Christ. He's the Jewish Messiah. I just couldn't, I just couldn't see it. The same Jesus who killed my family, who put me in a concentration camp, who they experimented on, they beat and they killed. How can you believe in that? How can you believe in a God? I threw out my daughter because she believes in him. 
and I sent my husband into that house and he became a believer. He didn't want to go to the synagogue with me even though I had the best seats. And, but there he believed. I mean, it used to be a peaceful, loving house. Jesus comes in and there's a war. I said, I'm going to teach them a lesson. I'm going to find the killer Jesus. And I went down the basement and I locked myself in. I looked in my Bible. Now, I knew in my Bible, the one the rabbi gave me, there's no Jesus in there. So I put it aside. I picked up my daughter's Bible and I started reading it and reading it and reading it and I started again to read it because I knew I missed it. I was about four or five days in that basement. I didn't do housework, I didn't do cooking, I didn't do cleaning. Nobody was allowed to come near me. I was a tyrant. I was a tyrant as it is, but I was really a tyrant at that time. After reading it so many days, I just couldn't find any more excuses. I noticed that he was the lamb, not the lion. And he didn't kill me. He didn't put me in a camp. He didn't kill my family. That he died for me. Did you know that? He died for me. He loved me this much that he gave himself for me. I didn't convert. I'm Jewish, you see. I found the God of Israel. And to his glory, I serve him. Pick up your own Bible. There are 328 prophecies from Genesis to Malachi. In the Hebrew scriptures, it's from Genesis to Chronicles. And there are so many prophecies of coming of the suffering servant. Read it. Just read it. And come to your own conclusion. Who am I talking about? While there is not much similarity between Jesus and the character of the Lone Ranger, there is something in the title that matches. Jesus was, in effect, a Lone Ranger, or maybe we could call him the Lone Messiah. Jesus stood alone for many reasons. He was and is unique, his mission exclusive, and he was misunderstood by those around him, even those closest to him. The events of Matthew 12 point us to Jesus warning those whom he encountered to not spread the news of who he was far and wide. This being explained for us by underlining how Jesus was and is the Messiah, meaning anointed one or Christ chosen by the Father to bring salvation and restoration to his people. Jesus did not fill, fulfill that office in the way those around him would come to expect. And we see this throughout the Gospels. One particular occasion that sticks out for me being John chapter 7, while Jesus is ministering in Galilee with his disciples. So let's consider John chapter 7 for a moment before we come back to where we have been in Matthew chapter 12. Just like in Matthew chapter 12, John chapter 7 points us to the Jews waiting to take Jesus' life, looking for their opportunity to get rid of this troublemaker once and for all. But even though this is the case, the brothers of Jesus come together and they say to him, Jesus, get up there to Jerusalem. Go to the Feast of Tabernacles. This is your moment. We have witnessed the miraculous works that you have been doing. Now it's time to make them more visible. They wanted him to get on with it, to promote himself, to go to the Feast of Tabernacles so that he would be frontline news, a chance to grab the limelight, to reach as many people as humanly possible. Everyone would be at the feast. This was Jesus' opportunity. They said, get out there and show yourself to the world. You see, there was a sense in Jewish thinking 
that the Messiah would come and prove himself. Therefore, in the minds of Jesus' brothers, he had to be at the center of all things, keeping up the profile, keeping the message going. Jesus' brothers must have been thinking, do you remember that time that the people gathered together and wanted to make Jesus king? Do you remember that? And then, and then Jesus ran away up the mountain. Well, this is an opportunity for Jesus to get that popularity back. This is an opportunity for Jesus, if he played it right, to really go to the Feast of Tabernacles and get that popularity and get back on to this frontline news. Because there are loads of whispers. Everybody's talking. It will just take one more wee push and, and we will get it over the line and we will be with Jesus in the middle and in the centre of all the acclaim and all the acknowledgement and all the attention. The sad thing is though that Jesus' brothers in a sense did have confidence in Jesus. They had witnessed the miracles that he had performed and they had confidence that he could go up to Jerusalem and do the same thing again. But the problem was they believed in Jesus' power, but they did not believe in him and who he was. It's important for us to stop and realize that believing that Jesus is a great miracle worker or a, wiz, a wise teacher alone, and believing only that lacks the faith that Jesus seeks us to have. For example, in John 2, there are loads of people who come together believing that Jesus can do these things. Believing that Jesus has great power. Believing that Jesus has great wisdom. But what does Jesus do? John writes, he does not entrust himself to them because he knows their hearts. That type of belief is like believing unbelief. Believing in the power and in the wisdom of Jesus. But not believing in Jesus and who he is. You see, for those that gather around Jesus... Someone with such power and wisdom, he could be king. He could be conqueror of the Romans. And as far as they were concerned, that was plenty. Yet, is that really the faith that Jesus was wanting them to have? Is that really the faith that Jesus seeks us to live by? Looking to Jesus and seeing someone who would do what we needed him to do. Someone who would affect our lives in the way we would want him to. In other words, is Jesus a commodity for us to use to make our lives more comfortable? Is that really what Jesus wants us to do when he says for us to live by faith? Is Jesus just to champion our causes and the things that we want to see come to pass? Or is Jesus challenging us to come and to live by faith and believe in him means something deeper than that? It must be. Because that's what Jesus again and again seeks of the people who come to see him time and time again throughout the Gospels. And that believing unbelief that I mentioned, Jesus wants nothing to do with. You see, if we see Jesus as just a great miracle worker, if we see him just as a good teacher, we miss the whole idea of what genuine saving living faith is all about. And that's why Jesus goes up to the feast in secret. And he says, if you like, to his brothers, Beware, brothers, for your love of glory and power and acclaim, that is not my way. We are pointed by passages like these two to remember that the kingdom of God seems so small and fragile at first, like a mustard seed, or as quiet and subtle as leaven working in a lump of dough. The only people who will ever see it are those whose hearts are humbled by its power. Those who allow themselves to be winged away from the love of worldly praise. Jesus is saying to his brothers, No brothers, if all you see is miracles, and all you want is to have your worldly longings and attention for praise gratified, then you do not yet believe in me, for that is not my way. Jesus is not saying that his miraculous works and his teaching are unimportant. He says that they point us to the truth, that they can help us to believe, help us to understand. Yet they are not all that we are to see. They are not to be the limit of our belief. They point us to a deeper belief, to a deeper faith, to a full understanding of Jesus. One that is not confined to wisdom and power, but is wrapped around who Jesus is as a person. 
Jesus' brothers, like most people, only focused on the outward show of power and had no eyes to see that there was a special character about the miracles that Jesus performed. They only saw what he did, but they never stopped to think about why and what that miracle would teach them. You could say that the miracles of Jesus had a soul to them. They weren't a demonstration of raw power. They were a sign to the identity of who Jesus was and a sign to the movement and the work of God, a sign to what was being accomplished and what was yet to be accomplished and that Jesus was he who would make these accomplishments come to pass. Those that clapped and applauded and wrapped around Jesus, shouting his praise, seeking to make him king, or the brothers who slapped him on the back and said, Jesus, go up to Jerusalem and do this thing, were actually those who, instead of becoming an encouragement to Christ, were a temptation and a distraction from the mission at hand. And that brings us, therefore, back to Matthew 12, where we are greeted with a Messiah on a mission. Christ quotes from the prophet Isaiah uh, is central to us and we'll explore that just as we come to the end why that quote is so important for us to take away today but previous to that passage Jesus describes himself as gentle and lowly in heart his greatness by no means being weakness his gentleness I mean no means being weakness see the Lord is unafraid to confront the religious leaders he was unafraid to cleanse the temple He was unafraid to allow those around him to clap and give him homage as Christ on Palm Sunday. And all of this was building, if you like, bit by bit by bit, until he finally identified himself as the Messiah days before he died. There was no longer a warning to not tell people who he was. That was the point in time when everyone was to know and Jesus made his identity known. Jesus knows that when he does that, this will hasten his move towards Calvary. And that's why he waits on his father to do things at the correct time and to allow his identity to be made known at that moment in his father's timing, leading to the end of his mission on earth and the beginning of the new mission of the church to go to the cross to die and then to rise from the dead, giving to his church a mission to go and finally, once and for all, tell everyone far and wide to the very ends of the earth that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. If people had really known and understood what the Messiah would have to do, Jesus would have just proclaimed himself as Christ from the very start. But Jesus knew that they wanted a conquering king, not a suffering servant who goes to the cross before receiving his true crown. And that's why Jesus waited until that opportune time for his identity to be made known without restraint so that those who had believed in his identity, who had witnessed the soul of his miracles, could deepen their belief in him and then step up to share the wonder and truth of who he is with those that they would come in contact with wherever they would go. And this brings us to one more we thought to send us on our way before we bring our service to a conclusion together. Jesus shows himself as the suffering servant, unwilling to break the bruised reed or smolder or, or smother the smoldering wick. In other words, not to discard that which otherwise appears useless. That's comforting. Because just as his identity is not based on earthly achievements, fame, acclaim, pride, and the things and stuff of this world, we can find that in trusting in him, believing in him, that our identity is not based on earthly achievements, fame, acclaim, pride, and the things and stuff of this world. That Christ's people, those who have believed in him, are not a collection of super achievers who have it all sorted out, but a gathering of broken, faltering people who see the folly of thinking that they have the means to fix things by themselves. And so they call out to him whose arms are open to receive. He who in a world of confusion and loss would point the way, teach the truth and give the life. 
The fact that Jesus will not snuff out a smoldering wick or break a bruised reed is of great encouragement. Because when others would give up on us because of our failures, Jesus still sees fit to use us. So if your faith is weak today, know that Christ does not love you any less. Ask him, believe in him, the lone Messiah, and he will not put you out, nor will he break you. But by his word and his spirit, he will lift you up tall and fan the faith that seems to be faltering into a glowing flame, a fire in your belly that cannot be denied. Jesus, Messiah, calls us to believe in him. And in doing so, we find that he fulfills the promises that were made. Each day, fanning us, helping us stand, being his people, the people of the Lord Messiah. Let's pray. As we approach the end of our time together, receive our prayers for the world and for the church. We lift to you those that govern us, those who work so that we may be safe, those who are ill or struggling in whatever way. Today, we are mindful of the family of Ruth Carnew and lift them to you that they may know health and strength. We take a moment to pray in the quiet of this space for the world, for the church, and for our own lives. We take a moment to lift to you our own prayers. Father, receive our prayers, our offering, and our service to you. Keep us in this community of faith, the church of your Son, Jesus Christ, and help us to confess him as Messiah and Lord in all that we do and say. We ask this in his name. Amen. So once again, John will play a hymn for us. This time we will read, follow along and reflect upon the words of the head that once was crowned with thorns.
now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us this day, and indeed forevermore. Amen.